Um, so welcome to the DDPS seminar, everyone. Um, before we introduce our invited speaker, let's go over some rules and logistics as usual. First of all, please mute yourself during the talk unless you have questions. If you have questions, you are welcome to unmute and ask. Otherwise, please use chat room to post your questions so that we can address them in Q&A session at the end. Second, today's DDPS seminar is open to external audiences. Therefore, no classified discussion is allowed. So please watch out. Finally, the talk today will be recorded and uploaded in our YouTube channel. That's about it. Now let me introduce our speaker today. It is an honor to host Dr. Uh, Tao Lin Wu, who is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of Computer Science at Stanford University, working with Professor Joe Laskovac. His research interests include representation learning and machine learning for scientific simulation and inverse design using tools of graph neural networks and information theory. He obtained his PhD in MIT physics, where his thesis focused on application of machine learning to physics and introducing physics insights techniques into machine learning. Today, Thailand uh, will give a talk about learning to accelerate large-scale physical simulations in fluid and plasma physics. I'm sure he will give a wonderful talk, so please enjoy it. Now, without further ado, let me pass the button to Thailand by asking a random question. Uh, that is, it's not that random. Uh, the question is, what is your favorite things to do during the weekend? After answering this question, you can go on with your talk, Thailand. Um, okay, so very nice to uh, meet you all. So the question, uh, I think the thing I like to do most in the weekend right now is to watch sci-fi movies. Watching movie, okay. Sci-fi, sci-fi sci movies. What movie? Uh, sci-fi movies. Oh, sci-fi sci movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Any favorite movie you can name? Uh, like the Expanse, or maybe some other uh TV that includes sci-fi. Okay. Well, I I don't watch sci-fi movie usually, so I don't know them. All right, it's mm -hmm. eight years. Okay. So yeah, very nice to uh, meet you all. Today, my topic is about learning to accelerate large-scale physical simulations in fluid and plasma physics. So, uh, firstly, I would like to give a, a bird-wide overview of the different kinds of simulations we might encounter in applications. Uh, the first kind is that we uh, discretize the whole state into a fixed grid or a mesh, and we want to um, like simulate their evolution on this mesh. Second, we have the particle-based simulation in which uh, the individual uh, elements are the particles that can move around. This includes like water or galaxy uh, simulation. Uh, the third kind is the particle in cell simulation in which we, uh, the elements include both the grid and the particles. Uh, this is mainly uh, you, uh, applied in the uh, plasma physics where we have both the field and the ions and electrons as particles. So, uh, simulation is very uh, important in both science and engineering. And I think there are at least two characteristics that are um, omnip omnipresent in all of these simulations. One is that they are very, typically very large scale in size. It is typically at the forefront of the high performance computing. And nevertheless, even with this uh, much computation, uh, it may still take a long time and to do some reasonable simulation for some small systems. For example, for a 3D laser plasma integration system, uh, in order to uh, have, make it to have some reasonable uh, like system simulation, you may need uh, billions of cells and to simulate over a long time step. And even then, you may still um, like uh, simulate only a fraction of the usual uh, a system that we want to simulate. The second characteristic is the following. Uh, the dynamics typically is multi-scale and have a large dynamic range. Uh, for example, uh, the, there are some fine-scale uh, dynamics. There are, there, there are some very high, highly energetic uh, parts of the system that we need to resolve to a fine scale. 
but there are also some other parts of the system that are less dynamic, and we can use a coarser uh, grid. And it is typically uh, not, not possible to simulate them using a single scale. For example, for a plasma system, uh, where there's a laser that's shooting from the left, you can see that the middle has a very dynamic uh, uh, evolution. And the, maybe there are only a small percentage of particles are accelerated, but it can, uh, for example, uh, constitute a large fraction of the energy. And this opens the door for optimization that we can maybe use the different uh, scale or different uh, models to simulate different aspects of the system. Sorry. So typically to address this uh, simulation uh, in the large scale systems, uh, we have the classical solvers, uh, which are based on first principles and interpretable. And they are accurate and have some good error guarantees. But the challenge is that they typically require a large engineering efforts to develop and is typically slow because of due to the limitation in the time interval or the implicit method required to ensure the numerical stability. Recently, there are a surge of the data surrogate models, which offers some benefits. Uh, the pros are the following. Because the model can uh, learn the, the model from the data, it requires less engineering effort. And also, it can use a larger time interval and maybe use the explicit forward evolution, which can be faster in inference time. And it has the potential to address the multi-scale challenge where we can use different uh, models to learn different aspects of the system. But on the other hand, there are also some challenges of the deep uh, data-driven models, which are, uh, there are some challenge in the long-term rollout to ensure that we can still maintain the numerical stability that we roll out the system for a long time. And also currently it lacks some theoretical guarantees for the generic uh, deep learning model. So I think uh, these two parts, these two solutions for the simulation are not one replacing the other, but I think the best way is to combine the best of both worlds, where either we can use the machine learning to correct parts of the classical solver, or we can uh, incorporate some inductive bias into the deep learning model to make it more accurate and long-term stable. So here I will first provide a general definition of the dynamic system and the problem we want to solve. So a dynamic system can be thought of as there are some state of the system that is evolving, which is U of T. And uh, this state can be defined on a grid, a mesh, or as a collection of particles, or it can be even as a function. And then the P here is the static parameters of the system. For example, uh, it can be some diffusion coefficient, or it can be the mass of the particle, etc., uh, which does not change with time, but influence the system at each time step. And we have the boundary of the system satisfying some boundary condition. We also may have some control, external control, F of T, that we exert on the system. And then we have a ground truth uh, model, F of star, that evolve the state. It can be a ground truth solver, or it can be some measurement of the actual physical process. And the problem we want to address is the following. Uh, given the tuples of the state at each time step, as well as the static and control parameters, and also the target at the next time step, we want to learn a model that can uh, match very well with this prediction. And the goal is not only to predict one time step very well, but also in the inference time when we evolve the system using this model, also regressively, we can still uh, obtain a reasonable evolution. And the F of theta here, in general, can be a convolutional neural network. It can be a graph neural network, or it can be a neural operator that evolves the function itself. So besides this, we can also have the inverse problem of, like, suppose that we have already learned the model, 
And uh, now we also have some objectives we want to optimize. For example, we want to um, design the boundary of the system such that it optimizes some objective like minimize the drag or maximize some certain uh, objective. And then the problem is then to optimize some static parameter or maybe the boundary or maybe the control parameter such that it optimizes our predefined objective. So in this talk, I will try to address uh, the following two to three questions. So first question is how to learn a model f of theta that can faithfully evolve the system long term. And the second question is uh, if the state u of t has a multi-scale dynamics, uh, how do we properly model it? And if we have time, we can also touch upon uh, some of uh, recent work of our work that perform the inverse optimization of the learned model. And uh, note that uh, our solution is just some solution uh, over one, one, one over many possible solutions, and it is still in the active development. So for the first question, uh, we mainly focus in on a subsurface simulation in which we want to model the rollout, the simulation of the oil and water flowing underground. For the second uh, question, the multi-scale challenge, we mainly focus in on a plasma laser system uh, that we want to model its multi-scale dynamics. For the third question, uh, we are mainly uh, investigating it on a navier stokes equation uh, fluid. So for the first, uh, for the first uh, part, subsurface simulation, uh, this is uh, the collaboration with Aramco company. So basically the problem is the following. Uh, we want to develop a model that can predict the flow, the flow of fluids. For example, the water or oil or, or the gas through the porous media underground. And this is essential for the management of the oil and gas and groundwater resources. And it's also pivotal in industrial applications, for example, in oil industry. And having a good model can ensure a fast and accurate uh, like evolution that are needed for the downstream decision making. For example, how to or where to drill a new well. And it is also important to ensure that the production is economically uh, efficient and may be able to reduce the carbon emission. So as a background, here I will introduce the a simplified PDE for the system. Basically, the whole simulation tries to model how the pressure as well as the water and oil saturation uh, like evolve on the ground, where basically uh, the S of I is the saturation of either the water or the oil, which the saturation means that what is the fraction uh, of the uh, water or oil that uh, occupies the porous media of the rock, which goes from zero to 100%. And then the pressure is the P here. Basically, the change of the saturation of water or oil depends on two terms. The one term is the source or sink, where the source or sink are the wells that either inject water or maybe produce the water or oil at the cell location. And then there's another term, uh, which is the divergence of the flux. Basically, the change of this situation depends on the source of sink and also the total amount of the fluid flowing into the current cell, where the flux here is proportional to the gradient of the pressure. Basically, uh, you, it will flow from the high pressure place to a low pressure place, where the coefficient here depends on what we call a relative permeability. And this relative permeability, Krj, also is a nonlinear function of the saturation itself. So basically, this will make the whole PDE nonlinear and very uh, challenging to simulate. So classical solvers typically use an implicit method to evolve the system where each cell uh, will uh, constitute one equation, uh, where even like if we have millions of equations, a million of cells, then we have a millions of millions of equations, and then it will be very uh, time-consuming to solve. And uh, so, for the current uh, physics-based and data-driven models, 
you still need to address the long-term evolution multi-scale dynamics challenge. Uh, where the multi-scale dynamics means that we need to model both the uh, pressure dynamics, which is happening on a much global scale, and also need to model how the water and oil flow uh, between the neighboring cells, which is much, much more local. And also we need to scale to millions of uh, nodes. So uh, to address this question, uh, like typical physics-based models uh, project the whole system into some uh, reduced basis. Uh, although it can simplify the system, it, will, it is inefficient, insufficient to model this nonlinear multi-scale behavior. For the data-driven models, uh, typically it uses the data to learn the evolution, and it has shown the promising results. But up to now, it has been limited to apply to the 2D problem uh, with up to 10K cells. And the work the, that is most similar to ours is the graph neural simulator that is developed by DeepMind, where they apply it for the particle-based simulation and apply it up to 20K particles. Uh, but, that pro but that model is not uh, designed for this uh, system, which is uh, based on a mesh. And also, it is much less uh, size. So in this work, we basically introduce a hybrid graph network simulator, uh, which consists of a graph neural network to model the dynamics of the water and oil, and also a 3D unit, which models the more global dynamics of the pressure. And we also develop training techniques to improve the long-term accuracy and output performance on uh, strong baselines. And we apply up to 1.1 million cells and achieve total 18 fold speed up. So uh, recalling our previous diagram, and in this system, our input uh, contains the dynamic variables, which are pressure and the saturation. And then the static parameter includes the rock properties, such as the permeability, porosity, and so on. Uh, which model how the rock is able to transduce fluid. And we also have the control variable, that is uh, how much of the uh, fluid is injected to the cell at each time step. And then we also have some computing features, uh, which we compute for the network to be able to uh, easier to model. And the output is the dynamic variable at the next time step. So, uh, basically, yeah, here our model has two parts, the GNN and the 3D unit. Basically, we discretize the whole uh, 3D grid into this uh, 3D cells structure, where for the GNN, we model each cell as a node, where it has the uh, edge uh, that connecting it to its six neighbors. And then uh, our GNN uses this uh, encoder, processor decoder, um, uh, architecture, where the encoder embeds the input into some latent graph of the node and the edges. And the processor includes a stack of M layers. Uh, each layer, it performs the typical uh, GIN operations, where it first uh, based on the every pair of nodes and the edge feature to compute the uh, a message between each pair of nodes. And then it aggregates the message on each node. And then based on the aggregated message, it will use it to update the node feature at the next, next 10 steps. And after a few layers of this, uh, the last layer's node feature will be used as the prediction for the next 10 steps. So uh, having this model, we still have the challenge of the long-term rollout. Basically, what we find is that even if uh, we uh, train the model with one step loss to a very low loss, it is still uh, very hard to roll out into a long time step. Even basically, the error will diverge. And the cause of this is that uh, during rollout, we use the model's prediction as the input for the next time step. And the error by the model can accumulate after we roll out for longer time steps. And to address this uh, press, uh, problem. 
uh, Pathworks has introduced uh, several approaches. One is to add noise into the training input, and this noise can simulate some of the rollout error during the inference and can make the model more robust. And then an another work by Max Rowling, they introduced the uh, noise, uh, adversarial noise, which are generated by the model's rollout itself. So in this work, uh, we find that when we train the model with the autoregressive rollout, it actually performs uh, much better. And specifically, what we mean is the following. Uh, typically, when we train the model, we just use, we just use the model to predict the one time step in the future, and then we compare it with the ground truth. So this is the one step loss. Uh, but instead, we also uh, use the model to roll out a few more time steps. And for each time step in the future, we also compare the ground with the ground truth and compare the loss. And our goal is to minimize the summation of all the losses. And in this way, the model is trained to model the long-term dynamics better. And we have some weights for each uh, time step, uh, focusing more on the one step loss, but also have some weight for the uh, longer time steps. Uh, yeah, so in this way, we find that uh, it, it allows the model to go out much longer. Uh, apart from this, we also have the challenge of the large size because each step we have millions of cells per time step. Uh, we cannot fit the whole thing into a single GPU. Therefore, we introduced the sector based training in which uh, basically we partition the whole data, whole grid, into many sectors. And in each sector, uh, we also have the overlap in the sector because we don't want to compute the loss uh, at the boundary of the sector because they are less uh, accurate. So then uh, we can just use the sector as the training data instead of the, of the full grid. So here are some results of, the, uh, of our method. We basically compare our method with uh, some strong baselines of the 3D unit and a convolutional neural network. We roll out the model for 10 steps or 20 steps into the future and compare the prediction of the pressure, water, and oil. And as you can see, our model uh, outperforms the other models by a large margin. Uh, margin. We also performed the ablation study in which uh, one ablation is that we only use either the 3D unit or the GNN to model the whole system instead of uh, modeling them respectively. And we find, and we find that uh, the, the error with the full model is much better than using a single model to model them both because uh, the 3D unit is more suitable to model a more global dynamics and the GNN here is more suitable to model a local dynamics. We also find that if we train with one step loss, the performance is much worse than trained uh, with a multi step loss. Uh, this uh, um, like confirms that the multi step loss can really help the long term rollout. And here we see that our model uh, have a less, much less cells uh, that have some error above some threshold. So here is some rollout where we see that we have some injector that inject water uh, into some, some place. And then we have a producer that produce the oil or water. And then as the time goes by, uh, we see that the water is flowing from the injector to the producer in the middle. And we see that our model uh, matches very well with the ground truth. Uh, and here it is the oil uh, visualization in which we see that the oil is depleted uh, due to the producer in the middle. And it matches also very well with the ground truth. So for the speed, uh, our method, our model uses uh, 20 seconds to roll out 20 steps uh, with a GPU. In comparison, a standard solver with multiple uh, nodes takes around 46 seconds to 370 seconds uh, to do the same uh, simulation, which we uh, is a total 18 fold reduction in the time. And right now we are scaling out our model to 15 million cells, and we are also able to uh, model the well, uh, well production uh, with very small loss. Yeah, so basically in this first part, 
uh, yeah, uh, we introduced this hybrid uh, model to model this subsurface assimilation. And we introduced these multi-step loss to improve the long-term rollout. Okay, so this is the first part uh, of the subsurface simulation. For the second part, we are going to introduce our work on the laser plasma interaction. Uh, basically, in here, uh, th uh, this is the work uh, we collaborated uh, with Slack and UCLA. So, firstly, what is a plasma? So, a plasma uh, consisting of ions and free electrons. And unlike the typical materials that where the electrons are bound to the ions, in the plasma, the uh, electrons can freely move around. And the uh, electrons and ions are interacted via the EN field. Examples of this are the fire, the sun, the lightning, etc. So the laser plasma interaction is a very important application where we have some laser, uh, high energy laser that shoot from the left. And there are some material here uh, that are in a sudden vaporized into a plasma. And then after the interaction, some of the ions or electrons will go to the backward and it will hit some target on the back background here, uh, which can be used for material or medicine or fusion. So typically uh, to model this process, a particle in cell method is used, uh, which use both the cell and the particles to model the whole dynamics. So, so the simulation of the plasma is very difficult because of the long-term interaction between the ions and electrons. Uh, and suppose that we have n ions and within the time frame, each ion can actually uh, influence all the other uh, electrons or ions. So there is a n square, uh, for example, n square time complexity of the system if we model a pair by interaction between each particle. Uh, and if the n is millions, then the n square will be trillions, which is uh, in, impossible to simulate. Uh, typically, the physics uh, solution is the following. Uh, instead of modeling the pairwise interaction between ions and electrons, we use the field, EN field, as a medium to transduce the interaction. Basically, uh, we model both the ions, electrons, and the field, and they interact uh, locally. And specifically, the whole simulation of the PIC, particle in cell, consists of this uh, four-step process. Uh, basically, the ions and electrons can move freely, and we model the electromagnetic field on the vertices of the grid. And in the first sub-step, we interpolate the electromagnetic field from the grid vertices to the particle to obtain the field at the particle location. And then based on the field, uh, we use the Lorentz uh, equation to uh, advance the momentum and the position of the field, uh, of the particle. And then the next, test, next step, uh, when the particle moves, it will also induce some current and the current we can deposit them onto the field vertices. And finally, based on the field nearby and also the current deposited, we can also update the field at each time step. So basically we iterate this four sub-step process to evolve both the ion electron and also the field. So is this clear? Okay, so uh, typically uh, this laser plasma interaction uh, involves the multi-scale dynamics. By multi-scale, I mean the following. Suppose the laser shoot from the left and this uh, bulk is the plasma. And we can see that only a small fraction of the uh, region is high, uh, excited and the a majority of the whole region is like very static. In the position and momentum of phase space, we can also see that a majority of the particles uh, stays uh, in the quasi-thermal background where their distribution of the momentum 
uh, obeys a Gaussian distribution. And a small fraction of the particles, they are uh, injected by the laser to a high energy. And they constitute a majority of the energy, but they have very small flexion. So we can see that here, there is a scale separation in the momentum of the particles. And the typical part in, particle in cell, uh, solver, needs to resolve the smallest skin depth here uh, and to model the highly dynamic uh, particles as well as all these uh, thermal particles at the same time, uh, which is very, very inefficient because this part of the particle that is thermal can be modeled with a much coarser scale. And such uh, similar uh, types of like multi-scale dynamics can be also find in many other applications where a small fraction of the system is highly dynamic and need to resolve to a very fine scale. And a majority of the system is much less dynamic. Uh, this can be found in some nuclear fusion and also in galaxy formation. And recall that the benefits, the cons and challenges of the classical solvers and the data-driven models. So to address this multi-scale challenge, uh, why not combine the best of both worlds where we use the accurate uh, solvers to model the very dynamic particle and use the data-driven model to learn the more coarser uh, line uh, particles. So uh, based on this uh, idea, we basically introduced this uh, fluid and particle hybrid representation in which we use the fluid uh, to represent the majority of the thermal particles. And basically we model them using the moments of the particles in each cell. Best, uh, because in each cell, we may have hundreds of particles. To model them, we may uh, need to provide their state at, uh, for each particle. But if we model them as a fluid, where we can only use a mean or standard deviation, uh, for to represent all these particles in, in a single cell, then we can reduce it to a few numbers. And then we can use the neural network to learn the evolution of these moments. And for the other particles that are highly, highly energetic, we can still use the classical solver to evolve them. So by doing this uh, separation, we also have another thing that to, to do, which is injection. Basically, at each time step, there are also some particles that are injected from the fluid state to the particle state. And we also learn a neural network to model this injection from the fluid state to the particle state. Specifically, uh, our model is the following. So these are two time steps, n and n plus one. And then uh, we use the particle in cell solver to model and push those highly energetic particles from time step n to n plus one. And then we use a CNN to model the evolution of the moments at each cell, uh, at each time step here. And also we use another neural network, which is the particle injection network to model the injection of the particle from the fluid state. Basically this model predicts a distribution, like the mean and standard deviation of, of the distribution, and then sample from it, the new particles. So here are some results. And um, so this is the result for the fluid advanced network prediction. And uh, the x-axis is the position, and then the y-axis is the time step from 500 to 1000. And here we, uh, visualize the change of the electron density and the ion density uh, at each time step. And it is a single step prediction, which means that in each time step, we feed the ground truth and use and ask the model to predict one time step in the future. As you can see, <clears throat> the, our prediction uh, matches quite well uh, with the ground truth, uh, both for the electron and the ion. And it also uh, captures this periodic injection uh, of the uh, electrons and ions uh, uh, by the laser. So this is the fluid advanced networks. 
And then we also have the particle injection network where it predicts and injects the particle at each time step. And we can also see that the network's prediction uh, matches quite well uh, with the ground truth. So after having trained these models, the hard part is to combine these together to achieve a long-term rollout. <clears throat> and this long-term rollout, uh, yeah, uh, is extremely challenging, especially for this plasma system, because this system is highly uh, chaotic. So here are some results uh, uh, with preliminary results. Uh, we still need to uh, uh, improve our model right now, where we use our model. Uh, we provide the ground truth and some time step, and we use our model, including the uh, free advance and the particle injection to model their, to advance the full state um, for 20 steps. And uh, we can see that uh, right now, it uh, does not do so well, likely because that <clears throat> our model right now is trained you know, with one step. Uh, but later when we train with multi-step, maybe it can do better. And then here it is the prediction of the current at time step one and time step uh, 15, where the blue curve is the ground truth and the orange curve is the prediction. And we see that right now, it, Matches quite well. Um, <coughs> um, so in this part, uh, we have introduced this hybrid fluid and particle representation to address the multi-scale challenge of the momentum separation of the scale. And we use the um, fluid representation to represent the less dynamic thermal particles. And we also use the classical solver to evolve the more highly energetic uh, particles. And in this way, we can combine the best of both worlds and uh, the fluid part, because we use much less um, number of um, values, we can achieve speed up. So uh, now we have like five to 10 minutes. I will quickly uh, go through the third part, which is the inverse optimization. And basically, uh, before the, the two parts is the, we try to learn a model that can evolve the system long term. But after we have learned the model, uh, we are endowed with the capability of doing the inverse optimization of op optimizing the boundary or the some other aspects of the system. So basically, we can use the our learned model, and then um, use the objective to do back propagation with respect to the boundary or the parameter of the system. So then we can uh, optimize uh, our system to optimize this objective. So this is actually the method proposed by a DeepMind paper uh, this year, which. Firstly, they learn the physical simulation uh, from time step one to maybe 100. And then to optimize the boundary, they take the full gradient backward and then uh, to optimize the boundary. Uh, in their paper, they show that uh, it is able to learn a good optimization, but the, the cons is that uh, when the dimension is very large, like for example, millions of uh, cells per time step, this method is not scalable because we need to take the full gradient backward. Uh, and then each time we update the parameter, we need to do the forward and backward again uh, with these millions of time steps, uh, cells uh, over hundreds of time steps. So in uh, another work, we want to speed this up. And basically, we introduce this latent evolution of PDEs, in which instead of uh, like learning the evolution in the input space, where we want to predict the state at input space, we map our input into a latent space. And we, you, we learn a model that can evolve the state in a latent space. And only when it needed, we decode it back into the input space. So if the input space has millions of cells, our latent space can 
be maybe 100 times a uh, smaller number of, of uh, dimensions. In this way, we can achieve speed up both in the forward and in the backward optimization. So basically our architecture in this work is that we have an encoder that encodes the dynamics into some latent uh, representation V, which is a single vector. And then we also encode some static parameter P into some static latent state V of P, both of which V and V of P are some latent vector. And then we also learn a model G that evolves this latent vector. And the H here is the decoder. And so in the inverse of optimization, what we want to do is maybe that we want to optimize the boundary of the system. Uh, for example, uh, in the airplane design, you may want to design the boundary so that it minimizes the, the drag. And in the fluid control, you may want to uh, optimize the fluid boundary so that uh, like in here, the smoke can pass through the, the exit with some predefined uh, fraction. And uh, to do this, we can simply take the gradient backward instead of from the input space, we take the gradient backward in the latent space. Uh, and because of the latent space has much less dimension, uh, we can achieve speed up by uh, having this much less dimension dynamics. So here we compare with uh, our model latent evolution uh, with an ablation where we don't do the latent evolution and we evolve the whole state in uh, input space. We also compare with a uh, ablation in which we use the, uh, we also compare with the state of the art of the Fourier neural operator uh, model. And as you can see here, um, our model with latent evolution use much less time than the one in the, um, using the input space evolution. And also, uh, basically, for the objective we want to optimize, which is the fraction of the smoke that passes through some certain cell, uh, we can also achieve much less error. So, okay, so here it is the runtime uh, where our model here uh, is able to uh, use much less time uh, than the other comparison. Uh, we also show that with latent evolution, not only can we uh, model the inverse optimization uh, with much quicker and more accurate, we are also able to speed up the forward evolution uh, uh, with much speed up, with up to 15 times in speed and with four to 100,000 times compression of the space while achieving a similar uh, accuracy. For example, in the 1D system of the Burgers equation, uh, our model outperforms the state-of-the-art state PD learning models uh, sometimes and able to achieve uh, up to like, uh, like 15 times compression and then 10 times speed up. In a 2D navier stokes equation, our model is, is able to uh, model the evolution of the turbulent flow very well. And also the performance uh, is similar to the state-of-the-art model. And in a 3D navier stokes equation, uh, uh, our model is also able to capture in a reasonable way the turbulent uh, dynamics where we have a flow through the cylinder. Okay, so as a summary uh, in this talk, we aim to address the three questions uh, of the large scale simulation. So to answer the first question of how can we learn a model that can faithfully evolve long term, we introduced this uh, multi-scale, uh, multi-step rollout during training, which we demonstrate that it can uh, better evolve the mod uh, system uh, longer term. For the question of how can we model the multi-step scale dynamics where one part of the system uh, consists of very small fraction but can constitute a large fraction of energy. We use a hybrid fluid and particle representation 
to evolve it. Where we use the solver to represent and evolve the highly energetic particles. And we use the neural network to model the less energetic uh, parts where we model the, their evolution of the moment. And to speed up the inverse optimization, instead of um, doing it in the input space, we learn a latent evolution model in which we can optimize the boundary in the latent space. And we also show that we can achieve speed, uh, speed up while maintaining a good accuracy. Okay, this is the talk and thank you. And please ask questions uh, and yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk, Kylan. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, we do have a uh, questions uh, mm -hmm. in the chat room. Let me read it to you from the beginning. The first question from the Pat, um, he asked, don't data driven approaches still require the same engineering efforts to create a classical model in order to generate data? Uh, Pat, right there. I see. So uh, that was in response to one of the early to the early yes. slides, Tylan, where where you 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 were passing the two approaches, and you were saying that the that the classical approach required a big engineering effort. And but if you if you're going to use them to generate data, you still need to do that engineering effort, do you not? Uh, yeah. The thing is the following. So. Uh, the data from the deep learning mod, uh, data driven model, it can come from either the engineering uh, effort of the solver. It can also come from physical measurement, where we don't need to derive the solver, but also just measure it from the uh, from physical measurement. Uh, this is true in, um, for example, in many of the systems in which we may even not have a good classical solver. And, and and you get enough data that way? Uh, yes, it, it can. Yes. Uh, another, another part is the following. So, uh, one function of the data driven model is not to replace the solver. It is a uh, uh, aims to speed up the solver. Uh, basically, typically we already have a solver that requires much engineering effort, but they are quite quite slow. And to augment that. What we do is the following we can use the solver to generate the data and then the data general model can learn the evolution um, from the existing solver uh, but it can evolve much quicker and then based on this data general model it can do some exploration of the whole landscape and then when it finds a good candidate it can go back to the solver to do a more accurate solution. okay thank you mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess that was what Pat was pointing out. I mean, if you are using the, the data from the, the physics over, which is expensive, that that does require the engineering effort uh, yes. in some sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so that uh, the next question is from me. Uh, using those data, uh, like for example, one of the slides said 20K particle, uh, the mm -hmm. graph neural network uh, was able to train how long does it take uh, to train, right? Yeah. So to train the graph neural net. So in this system where it has uh, one million cells and then it has around one thousand time steps, it takes one GPU around two days to train. Okay. Yeah. I bet. And but with multiple GPU, we can speed up uh, the training time uh, with more resources. Yeah, I guess. All right. So next question is by um, Shatap. Um, he asked, uh, for the self-surface simulation and sector-based training and inference, mm -hmm. uh, do you mean at any given time only a sector of the data is used to train at a time? For example, for a single large mesh with 1,000 by 1,000 points, only mm -hmm. 100 by 100 sector of that is used at a time? Yes, exactly. Uh, basically, because of the evolution, uh, the PDE is local. This means that the equation that can be applied to the whole thing can be applied to a sector. And we just use a small factor. Uh, for example, in the whole system, this can be 100 times 100 times 100. But then we can use like 14 by, uh, like 20 by 20 by 20. And each time we feed this sector into the model to train. 
you gotta connect them together um in a consistent way by the way mm, we don't have to basically it's like the physical process that involves the whole thing is actually evolving the same uh same for the sector because the, of, of the following so the gn actually here is modeling the local evol dynamics basically it models how the cell is evolving based on the neighbors of the cell and it uses the same uh, model to model every node. This means that um, because it's, it's a local model, it can apply to any any location in the in the whole system. Right? Yeah, what what I meant is, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the the solution from the one sector uh, will affect the the solution in the neighbor sector, right? Oh yeah, oh that's one part uh, that needs to be taken care of, which is the following. Because we have sectors, then the boundary of the sector will receive less neighbors, and then their prediction will not be accurate. Therefore, we do not need we need to not compute the loss, uh, the objective on the boundary of the sector. Otherwise, it will bias the loss. Uh, basically, what we do is that we have some overlap between sectors. Yeah. Therefore, each cell will be at least in one sector. Yeah, with the with the overlay, they they see each other. Yes, <laughs> the neighbor. Yeah. Okay. Yes. The next question is by Alex. Do you also remap in the other direction from kinetic to fluid? I, I think it's related to the second topic. You. Yeah, that's a very good question. So in this work, uh, we do not remap back from the particle to the uh, fluid, uh, because um, this is both a simplification and assumption we, we make. And also because that once the particle is injected, it will be highly energetic, and very, very rarely it will go back into the fluid state with a very like like static and well behavior. All right, wonderful. Okay, uh, the question from Pat: um, Some of your MIT work use other induction methods to discover physical equations. Do you see deep neural nets as central to your speed up work, or might they be replaced with other techniques for inducing models from data? Uh, like, does this question mean that we want to infer the symbolic uh, equation of the, the model? Uh, could you cl clarify this question? Sure, that would be fine. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't care, it, does, it doesn't have to be um uh, an explicit equation i mean that you could imagine other other approaches to inducing models from data but certainly that's the one i had in mind because both you and i have worked on it mm -hmm. could, could you use could you use that as a subroutine rather than the the deep deep learning stuff i see so um what i think is the following so uh I think a reasonable way is the following. We can first use either GNN or some other neural network to learn the model very well, where the loss is some, for example, the prediction loss. And once we learn the model very well, we can uh, pass this learned model into a symbolic regression or other uh, pipeline in which we may be able to delve into this model and extract some some more insights or equations well, well you could do that i was asking yes. whether you might do it directly is there any reason mm -hmm. so for this uh i so what aspect what model do you have in mind for doing it directly well you're 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 you're, you're from the data Simulated or observed, you are basically building uh, PDE models, uh, mm -hmm. and you can encode those in different ways, right? You can encode them as a as a uh, as a deep neural network, or you can encode them as a, as a set of differential equations. And if you learn the differential equations directly, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, I, there may be something about this. I mean, certainly the where you go to the latent space, that's that's a another layer. But even in the latent space, you could imagine learning explicit symbolic equations. And I, I, the only reason to ask this question is because is this, I, I ask this question often in these talks. I want to 
tease apart what you know, what's the general principle versus what's the specific solution you came up with here, um, and if there are other approaches it, it, that people might prefer, should you know should they consider them? And, and we don't have to have a final answer here. I just wanted mm -hmm. to mostly just wanted to ask the question. I see. Thank yeah, you. I, I think this is a very, very good question. Uh, right now, I don't have a good answer. I think, um, as I said, another way is to maybe um, it, instead of using a generic like graph net network or, or other network, we can encode the network in a more like PDE like where we have more explicit terms and then we can learn, for example, the, either the coefficient or the parameter of those terms. This may, this more inductive bias. In, in I mean, I, I understand your reservation. I mean, if we learn the PDEs, then we're back to where, if you built it, where we had the PDEs by hand, it'll be just as expensive. The question is whether you could learn somehow more abstract, mm -hmm. more aggregate level PDE models that would run much faster like the neural net. That's the question. I don't have an answer yet, it, but it's worth considering. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you to uh, both. Um, the next question is uh, by Quick One. Um, hi, Talon. Um, it is an interesting talk. My question is how did you predict the laser plasma interaction that has a different input data dimension using a previously learned model? For example, you learn 1025 by 1025 grid to learn. Now we want to predict a 2048 by 2048 laser plasma interaction. Can the model automatically do that? Okay, very good question. So, um, yeah, the answer, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, because here, for both for the fully advanced network and the, and the particle uh, injection network, we use a CNN, a convolutional network, to model it. And we know that convolutional network basically is a local model that try to predict a cell's state based on its um, few neighbors in the grid using some kernel. Uh, therefore, uh, the common confidence here is ignorant of how large your training data is. It just care about the local dynamics. Therefore, theoretically, if we train with a smaller size, it is able to generalize to a much larger size. The same goes for the particle part, where the particle in cell server is by definition uh, able to uh, advance uh, like either small or large number of particles because it is still a local model that try to advance the particle uh, and the field in a local way, regardless of the size. Uh, hi, Tiny. Uh, yeah. So, uh, are you saying you are using the same kernel size uh, for different uh, dimension of input, and you use? Uh, are you keeping the uh, structure of the CNN the same, or you you use some way to uh, uh, for you use some way to tune the uh, depth of the neural network uh, for different dynamic dimensions? Uh by that different dimension, do you mean the different features? Uh, uh, I mean the different uh, the grid size. Uh, for, uh, when you are learning the uh, laser plasma interaction, mm -hmm. uh, I think there is a, a field field grid. Maybe you yes. want to input. So uh, the dimension when the dimensions are different, are you using the same uh, kernel size? Yes. For, uh, mm -hmm. But but then. Uh, then, so you are, uh, you have uh, same depth, same structure of the neural network, and you can still uh, recover the uh, info, uh, predict the informations in the plasma very uh, well. Uh, so, uh, actually, we haven't done this experiment yet, where we train with a smaller like size and then generalize to a larger size, but by definition. Of the like the conf, conf net. Uh, because the conf net actually is learning also a local model in which it just try to model, for example, our cells evolution based on the neighboring cells, for example, up to like a radius of like maybe seven or five. 
it is actually learning this local model for the CNN. Uh, and use basically during prediction, it uses this, this kernel to scan the whole the whole region uh, to, to, to predict. So therefore it can adapt to different input size. I mean also need to do this, this experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, if that work, I think that's huge because uh you can have super resolution by only learn a low learning on a low uh, low resolution uh, data set so oh actually uh here i, I want to clarify one thing which is the following uh, mm -hmm. when you say the different size do you mean that the resolution is the same but you make the grid larger in the position or do you mean you will have a different resolution well, I mean, I have a different resolution. Oh, I see. Oh, so if you have a different resolution, then a naive convolutional network will not work because the a naive convolutional network needs to take into account uh, have the same resolution at training and testing. Um, but there may be certain way to fix it. Basically, during prediction, we can also pass in the um, like, for example, the position or the relative position of to the input, and we can train it on the different resolution. And then, in this way, maybe the network can generalize over different resolution. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, the next question from Amit. I wonder if you have explored the PDEs containing a non-local terms. Do you see any potential problems in learning such PDEs using the methods you discussed? Okay, so um, we haven't explored that yet. Uh, what kind of non local time do you have in mind? I mean, are, are you there? Um, can you give an example of the non local? I mean, I, I see you are there. <laughs> You can unmute yourself. <clears throat> oh, I see the integral. Oh, integral over one of yeah, integral equation. I see. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, we haven't considered that. <laughs> um. But I think this might be a very interesting thing to explore. And what I can see the solution is that we, for the normal term, we can also add one turn in either the GNN or the CNN. Basically, for the GNN, in order to model a local term, what we can do simply is that um, we have a specifically designed GNN that have a, a much larger inputs uh, radius. And then based on that, uh, he use it, the GN to predict things and then sum over all the prediction to mimic the integ integral over the full grid. Um, basically, we can uh, use some similar inductive bias as the integral to model this non local term. And there is also this non local CNM that use attention to. Uh, address different non-local interaction. One problem, though, is that it will be very uh, costly to model because here each cell can be influenced by all the other cells, potentially. True, but I think even in conventional methods, you will still run into the computational cost issue. Yes. Um, so the question is whether this is doable or not. Um, using using something like this because often and i'm from quantum simulation background electronic structure methods mm -hmm. and there are situations where you don't explicitly know the pd like the functional form of the pd and, and there if you at least can learn the train a model to learn the pd that itself will be uh, will be great so that is what was the motivation behind this question um i see yeah, I, I, I see. And also, I think some of these uh, techniques can also be used, like sampling and other ways to make it more efficient. 
All right, sounds good. Um, so next question is by uh, the Pat uh, again. He said we can ask a similar one uh, about different time steps. I, I guess you're referring to this upscaling in the spatial grid. Yes. From, yeah. Yes, so you mean that we train with uh, one time interval, but then generalize over a different time interval? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is also a very, very good question. So, actually, in this work, let me check um, the MPPDE paper, my message passing PDE paper. And basically, what you can say is the following uh, In our current work, our, we are not able to uh, generalize over the different time interval. But uh, to do that, there are at least two ways. Uh, from what I thought. One way is that in during training time, we also put the time step or time t as input, or maybe the time interval as input. And then we train it with multiple different um, time intervals so that the network can learn to generalize over this time interval. This is one natural way. Uh, a second way is based on a neural operator uh, where a neural operator can take as input the time t and directly output the prediction. And they find that basically, if you train with some even some fixed time interval by the neural operator, it can generalize over both the time and the spatial resolution. Yeah, if you like, you can uh, see the paper which is called Fourier uh, neural operator. I can do both. Okay, thank you. You, you can ignore my last comment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, okay. Okay. I, I think the the last question is by Scott. A quick question: During your particle injection network steps, you use a CNN to predict a mean and a sigma of the uh, distribution. Doesn't this mean you are building a Maxwellian like uh, distribution in PIC? Oftentimes you get highly nonlinear distribution functions once you lose this. Um, so, yeah, basically, here uh, you are right that we are using a CNN to predict the mean and standard deviation of the distribution of the injected particles. For example, in here, we can see that. This part is the thermal, which is a Gaussian uh, in the momentum. But uh, for the injected particles in the momentum, we can also see that although they are highly energetic, at each time, uh, at each cell, they may still uh, be a, likely be a single band that have a different mean uh, and uh, standard deviation than the rest. We can think of it as there's a main main Gaussian peak, but there are some other outliers. And most likely it is a sing, um, maybe a single um, Gaussian uh, outside of the main peak. Uh, this is an appro appro approximation we, we make using a single Gaussian, but we may also try to use a mixture of Gaussian to model, model it. Okay, sounds good. I think that was the last questions and uh, the um, <clears throat> Amin asked about, <clears throat> he, he missed the, um, almost the entire of your presentation. He was asking about uh, if, if the recording is available and I put the link <clears throat> in the chat room. If you go to that uh, webpage, um, the, the, will, uh, the tail ends, uh, the recorded video will be uploaded there, um, not yet but it will be uploaded in the future, uh, near future. So you can check that out uh, in near future. All right, um, I guess, is there any other questions? Um, I mean, Talin did a wonderful job uh, answering all those uh, interesting questions. So, and as well as a wonderful talk. Well, let's thank Talin uh, for the wonderful job uh, today. And it was really good to have you. Uh, the Pat mentioned that it was nice to got Thailand to talk in this series. I, I totally agree with that.
Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you everyone for joining. And uh, I, I don't know the, when is the next DDPS seminar, but maybe in two weeks there will be another one. All right. Until then, uh, please um, be well and see you next time.